Well, we taught this song to you a couple weeks ago. If you don't know it, that's all right. It's a lot of fun. I promise you're going to love it. This first part, all you need to know is the word O. Think you can remember that? All right, it goes like this. Today we're able to gather together in the presence of our loving God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we've been going through a, kind of a, a series in Lent talking about love, today we're talking about envy, and how envy, uh, that love is not envious, but envy can kind of can kind of destroy uh, a little bit of love for others, love for God. And so we take a time, uh, a moment of time in the beginning of this service to kind of just confess our sins. To be honest before our God, if envy is one of those things, that's something you struggle with, you can confess that. But if you've got something else that is on your heart, on your mind today, uh, feel free to take this time and be honest with God and give it to Him. So I invite you to kneel or remain seated as we go to our God in a time of confession this morning. Lord God, Heavenly Father, You are love and You love us. 
And Lord, you call us to love one another. <laughs> you call us to, uh, to love you. And oftentimes, Lord, we don't do those things well. We, we fail, we fall, we struggle, we, uh, and we mess up. We got envy in our hearts. We compare all the time. And we got bitterness and, uh, that it exists in, in our lives, Lord. We're prideful, we're, we're rude, we're filled with anger. Lord, whatever it is that is in our hearts, uh, our lives, the decisions that we make that are not good, the decisions that we make that are not pleasing to you, uh, and Lord, the, ultimately the things that we carry, the guilt that we carry that really we shouldn't carry because you've asked us to give it to you because you want to carry it. So Lord, hear us today as we confess the sins that we carry, confess our guilt, confess our shame, confess uh, our sin to you. Now, while we could fill this moment of silence with probably, we could take a long time thinking of all the different ways and, and, and manners in which we have failed uh, God and, the, and the, the sins that we carry, we know this word today, that if you're carrying that sin, if you're feeling that weight, know that this weight is no longer yours, but it's taken from you because of Jesus, because of the cross of Jesus Christ. He picks up, he bears our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, by the blood of Jesus Christ, you and I are healed. Amen? Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may have a seat.
voices all together. So a couple of weekends ago, we began this series called Love Is. And you know that the, the series is based on 1 Corinthians 13, which is known as the love chapter. And lots of people know it because it's used at weddings and, and for anniversaries, all kinds of things related to love. But it's not usually associated as a Lenten text. Now you know what I mean by Lenten text. We, we began on Ash Wednesday, the season of Lent, and the season of Lent continues. It's 40 days long. Sundays are excluded, by the way. If you tr ever try to count, you come up with more days than 40. It's because the Sundays are considered little Easters every Sunday, and so they're excluded from the season of Lent. I know it's weird. I, I understand. But it's 40 days, and it begins on Ash Wednesday, and it takes us all the way up to Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and the, the climax, the, the, the high point of the Lenten season is Good Friday. That day when we remember that the incredible sacrifice that God made, the incredible sacrifice that Jesus made to, to give his life, to pour out his blood to save us. But what's interesting is that, that when we think about it, a text about love is exactly the right text, isn't it? I mean, what made God, what moved God to, to give his son? Well, John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, would not perish, but have everlasting life. And so 1 Corinthians is a great text. And it's a great way for us to, to think about it. And so as we move through this series, we're thinking about that perfect love of God and we're understanding it from the context of God's perfect love that moved him to send his son Jesus and how that love not only forgives our sins, it washes us clean, but it also takes root in our hearts and minds so that we begin to change. So that we begin to reflect that love and we begin to reflect the life of Jesus. So by way of, of refresher, make sure we're all on the same page, let's read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 together. Love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Love never ends. Well, the, the section we want to focus on today is that statement of what love is not. Love is, our love does not envy. Love does not envy. Now, you and I know envy. We understand envy. In fact, maybe, probably not for you, but at least for me, envy can be a part of our lives, right? So let's be clear on what envy is. So dictionary.com definition of envy. Envy is a feeling of discontent or covetous, covetousness which, with regard to another's advantages, success, possessions, etc. So in other words, envy is when somebody is unhappy or upset because they want something that somebody else has, or they want to do something that somebody else does, or they want the success that someone else is experiencing. And envy is powerful. 
In fact, Pastor Steve was telling me that the Greek word in the New Testament for envy means to boil. So out of control heat and, and energy that, that rises up inside. Envy goes all the way back to the, the Garden of Eden. It's part of our old sinful nature. Envy motivated Eve to want more than perfection. She wanted to be God. And so did Adam. And it started this whole mess that you and I have inherited to this day. A nature that, that absolutely gravitates toward envy. If you doubt it, We've all seen that picture that I talked about with the kids, right? Where one child has something and another child has a million options. Every possible, uh, closets and rooms and games and, and outside, everything else. They could do anything, but the thing they want is what that kid has. And they'll throw a temper tantrum to get it. They'll be in a rage. You want proof? Go by Pastor Ben's house later today. I'm just kidding. That's just... <laughs> Those two little girls are perfect. They never fall into that. But, but there might be some households where it happens. Yeah, we know that with kids, but the thing is, we don't outgrow envy. Envy sticks around. And it grows with us. And the horrible thing about envy as it grows with us is it becomes more complex, becomes deeper rooted, and it becomes more dangerous. Think about in our world all of the frivolous lawsuits. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't, there aren't valid and important and, and justifiable lawsuits. This isn't some, some battering against legal, our legal system or lawyers, but I'm saying there are lots of frivolous lawsuits. There are lots of junk lawsuits, and those kinds of lawsuits are motivated by envy. Because envy is destructive and it's dangerous. And what we're going to see when we, when we dig into this text is that, that envy is at the root of this deadly endeavor on the part of the religious leaders. Envy results in death for Jesus. Now I want to give you context. Make sure, because where the, where the passage is, and by the way, Melissa, great job reading the text this morning, but where the, where the passage begins, we sort of drop into the middle of the story, right? And to be sure that we don't leave anybody behind, I want to make sure you, you, you kind of connect the dots. You understand what's happening. So think about it this way. Jesus has been going about his ministry. And he starts out in obscurity, right? But he continues on until he's renowned. Everybody knows his name. Everybody knows about his teaching. Everybody knows he's out there. And the religious leaders do not like him because he's threatening, he's challenging everything that they hold dear. And they're irritated. And so as Jesus is teaching, as he's doing his miracles, as people or crowds are beginning to flock to him, the religious leaders are trying to derail him. Remember, they, they set up different situations. They ask questions. They try to pin him down. And, and Jesus, in this chess match, is always checkmating them. He's always got the brilliant, perfect answer that not only eludes their deceptions, but puts them on their heels. And so in this chess match series, Jesus has won every single match. But something happens that changes all of that. Do you remember the story of a man named Lazarus? Now Lazarus is well known. He is a religious leader and he's a prominent person and he's a big wig. And apparently he's also a nice guy. And he's got two sisters and they're well known. And the reality is that Lazarus gets sick and he dies. And they live in a town called Bethany that's about two miles from Jerusalem. And so he's well known. When he dies, it's a tragedy for the whole community. So this whole community flocks out to Bethany to grieve with these sisters, to be there and to help them through and to mourn with them. It's part of their custom. And so everybody shows up. Now remember, Lazarus dies, they put him in the tomb, he's been there four days, and these people are wailing and grieving and, and gathering around, and there's sadness, and, and the world is traumatic, it's a, it's a darker place because this great man Lazarus is gone, and Jesus shows up, and what's he do? He turns this wake 
into a celebration of life. And in front of all of these people, right before their eyes, he calls to that dead man in the, in the tomb and he comes walking out. Now, let, let's just pause. Let's think about, about something. Maybe it's, not even, maybe it's not even the picture of a funeral, but, but just think of something that you're skeptical about. Something where you have your doubts. You've heard all kinds of rave reviews. You've heard about how wonderful something is, a product or a service or something. You've heard that it's amazing. But you know, I've got my doubts about that. But you go to a presentation or you, you experience it in some way. Something happens and, and it happens. You're there and you experience it or you see it or you use it. And all of a sudden, it's better. It's a million times better than anybody's ever told you. It's a million times better than the ads suggest. And all of a sudden, you go from being a skeptic to being 1,000% convinced. In fact, you are so convinced you can't wait to tell somebody else. Imagine, you are there at Bethany. You've heard about Jesus. Maybe you've even heard one of his sermons. You think, dude, dude can preach. But pff, Messiah, <laughs> come on. Everybody thinks they're going to get to see the Messiah. Everybody thinks he's got to be right around the corner. Son of God, pff, come on. Miracles, please. But you're there. You got there on day one. You helped wrap the body in the cloths. You were one of the guys that, that helped carry him into the tomb and laid him there. You held his body. You know that it was lifeless and cold, and they laid him in that tomb. And you've been there the whole time, grieving. And Jesus comes along and calls him back to life. What would that do to you? Well, it would do to us exactly what it did to those people. They go from being skeptics, tentative followers, interested, to being amazed that they have seen the work of God in front of their eyes. And they can't wait to tell somebody else. And all of a sudden, this chess match that the religious leaders have been playing with Jesus to try to discredit him, to try to, to sort of show him up to be a fool, to, to, to take him away from his followers, all of a sudden, they go from playing chess with him to, to strategizing and figuring out because Jesus must. What? He's got to die. They don't want to discredit him anymore. He must die. In fact, remember the, the prophecy that the high priest utters. He doesn't utter it intentionally, but he, he makes a prophetic statement. Better that one man die than the whole nation perish. The reality is that they recognize that if Jesus continues with this kind of thing, with this kind of power, the people are going to flock to him. They're going to make him their king, and Rome is going to come crashing in because they all live under the umbrella of Rome. Rome will come crashing in, and they will not only crush the people, they will ruin the power that those religious leaders had. And so suddenly, they are convinced Jesus has got to die. And these people are good at strategy. And they're good at conniving. And they set up a plan. And they begin to put that plan into action. And so now where we are in the text is that Jesus has not only, not only had the last supper with his disciples, he's been in the garden praying with his disciples, he's betrayed by Judas, he's arrested, he's been taken before the Sanhedrin, the, the court of the religious leaders, and they have found him worthy of death. But those religious leaders who hate Jesus, and they know he's got to die, but they've got a problem, they can't do capital punishment. It's against the law for them to execute someone. Only the Roman government can do that. So that's why they take him to Pilate. They take him to Pilate and Pilate's got a problem because Pilate's a pretty good conniver himself. But Pilate hates the Jews. He doesn't just like them, he despises them. 
In fact, Pilate has really gotten himself between a rock and a hard place because Pilate hates the Jewish people so much, he, he, he mistreats them, he abuses them, he, he murders them when he can get away with it. In fact, Pilate has this track record of doing something that so inflames the people that they rise up and then he uses that as an excuse to go in and kill all of them that, have, that are a part of the demonstration. Word of this has gotten back to Rome, and Rome, while they have no love for the Jews, they don't want uprisings, they don't want unrest in their, in their lands that they control. And so they've said to Pilate, no more. If there's any more of this unnecessary bloodshed, you will be removed. So Pilate has these religious leaders come to him, and they have a man that they hate so much, they want him to die. Now, Pilate hates those religious leaders even more than he hates the Jewish people. So you know the old rule, right? The enemy of my enemy is my... See, if they hate Jesus so much they want him to die, he's an ally to me. He doesn't care about Jesus. He doesn't love Jesus. He doesn't follow Jesus. It's just if they hate Jesus that much, he doesn't want to do anything to him because he doesn't want to do what those people he hates want him to do. So he's pretty tricky himself. He's pretty good at at schemes and strategy. So Pilate makes a decision. He knows that the person, so in the Jewish religious leaders, Pilate is the most hated person. Second most hated, King Herod. Because King Herod is a Jew, but he doesn't follow any of the rules. And so Pilate decides the way that he can really, he can gall the religious leaders, he can stick it to them, is by instead of doing what he wants and executing Jesus, he's going to send him to Herod. Let Herod decide. And you can bet it irks those religious leaders. They are absolutely irritated beyond belief. But the problem comes that Herod sends him back. And so now, now Pilate's really stuck. What to do? But again, he's pretty good on his feet. And he has this custom, this tradition of releasing someone, releasing a prisoner. Because remember, the prisoners that he has in his prison, they are mostly hostages. And so when it comes to the Passover and this big festival for for the Jewish people, Pilate releases one of them as kind of a goodwill gesture. And so Pilate has this this brainstorm. It says in Mark 15, verse 6, at the festival, Pilate used to release to the people, release for the people a prisoner whom they requested. Well, Pilate's tricky, and so he gives the people a choice. He says, do you want me to release Barabbas? Now, remember who Barabbas is. Barabbas is an insurrectionist. He he riles the people up and causes them to rebel, and he's a murderer. Of all of the people that Pilate has in his prison, Barabbas is the worst guy. And he knows He says, you can have Barabbas, the murderer, or you can have Jesus, the gentle teacher that the religious leaders hate. Now, this is foolproof, isn't it? I mean, who in their right mind is going to want the murderer released back into society when the choice is this this nice guy? But Pilate has no idea who he's dealing with. Because remember what the religious leaders have been doing. They didn't just start that afternoon. They started way back, and they've been putting this plan together, and they've been working all of the parts and all of the pieces, and they've been manipulating the people. So that over the course of the last week, instead of Jesus seeming like this nice guy that they want to follow, Jesus has seemed more and more like he's betraying them. Remember the whole incident about taxes. They expect when the, when the People say to Jesus, should we pay taxes to Caesar? They expect him to say, no, pay no more taxes because they want to be free from Rome. But instead, Jesus says, render to Caesar what's Caesar's and God what's God. And all of a sudden, the people are saying, wait a minute. Who is this guy? So at the very moment when 
when they expect that Jesus is going to be the one, when, when Pilate thinks Jesus will be the one that the people want, he's not. I don't know if you've been following along with the whole Russians meddling in elections debacle. But it's fascinating, isn't it? No matter what you think about it, no matter what your religious or, I mean, your, your political affiliation, it, it, I, that's not my point here. I think the whole concept is fascinating. That there is this group of people completely outside of our system, system who schemed and connived and created news stories so that they could convince at least some people of something regarding the election. They could influence what they would think so that when it came election time, they could influence who was elected and how they were elected. Fascinating. You understand, that's exactly what these religious leaders have done. Pilate thinks he's brilliant in coming up with these schemes to solve his problem and to, to not do what his enemies want him to do. But lo and behold, the religious leaders are way ahead of him. They're way out in front. And so Pilate says, do you want this murderer Barabbas or do you want Jesus? And the people say what? Crucify him. You know, there's an interesting line in Mark chapter 15, verse, 50, verse 10. It says, Pilate knew it was because of envy that the chief priest had handed him over. You know, all kidding aside, do you ever struggle with envy? Ever struggle with that, that discontent? You want something that somebody else has? You know, I was thinking about that as it relates to... Uh, to a show, I've seen it a few times. Pastor Zach passed this article on to me, and I thought it was pretty cool. Have you ever watched Shark Tank? Okay, raise your hands if you if you've seen Shark. Okay, lots of people. I don't know if you know this. Just a side note: Joy Haman loves Shark Tank. You know Joy, who does the the video announcement for the auction. She loves Shark Tank. In fact. If Joy has come up, to, come up to me and told me about one Shark Tank idea, she's told me about a hundred Shark Tank ideas. And I always tell her, Joy, that's just dumb. Now, sometimes they're good, but I tell her they're dumb anyway, right? That's just sort of my duty as a big brother kind of guy. But, but the interesting thing is, you know, people bring these ideas and they get sponsorship and they get investment and, and sometimes they turn out to be big deals. So there was an article that Zach passed along. It was the, the eight top Shark Tank ideas in terms of success in the recent history. So the number one most successful in recent history was something called Scrub Daddy. How many people own a Scrub Daddy? <laughs> awesome. It's this super sponge that you, uh, that, that you use. And so when you put it in cold water, it gets hard. When you put it in warm water, it gets soft. And apparently, it, when, when you use it to clean stuff, it doesn't retain any of the junk. It just You squeeze it out and it gets clean. Well, the, the interesting thing is, not only did this get sponsorship, they have sold over the course of the last couple of years 10 million units and made $50 million. That's amazing. How about this one? Tipsy elves. Sounds a little, diff little dangerous, doesn't it? But tipsy elves is all about holiday apparel. So tipsy elves takes the ugly Christmas sweater concept and turns it into a profit machine. Tipsy elves got sponsorship on Shark Tank and their projected sales for 2017 were $8 million. Anybody have a, an ugly Christmas sweater? Wouldn't you like to turn that into $8 million? Yeah. Or one more, Groovebook. Anybody ever heard of Groovebook? Groovebook is this, is this interesting concept where it's a subscription-based concept and, and you take the, your pictures on your phone. I mean, how many people take pictures on their phone? Well, lo and behold, it's this automatic system where, you make, where, where they send you a high-resolution bound book of the pictures right off your phone. It, it syncs wirelessly. And the amazing thing is that this, this groove book concept, after they appeared on Shark, Shark Take, they immediately got 50,000 subscribers. And not long after, they sold the company to Shutterfly for 14.5 million bucks. 
Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever had an idea and then, then later like one of these Shark Tank things comes along and, and you see it and you hear about it being the smashing success and you go, I had that idea. That was my idea. And while it may not reach the point of envy, you're thinking to yourself, holy mackerel, they're making millions of dollars. Why isn't that me? That's what the religious leaders are doing. See, they were there first. They were the religious leaders. But Jesus is preaching like nobody's ever preached, and he's teaching like nobody's ever taught, and he's doing these miracles, and the crowds that are, should be following the religious leaders, they're following Jesus, and they will not have it. That envy takes root in their hearts and in their lives, and they want him dead. So they've contrived this plan, they've developed this scheme, they've executed this strategy, and so when the people are asked, do you want Barabbas, the murderer, or do you want Jesus, the chief priests had stirred up the crowd so much that they demand that Jesus be crucified. Who do you want, Barabbas or Jesus? The people say Barabbas. And then Pilate, in frustration, you can hear it in his words, well, what do you want me to do with Jesus? And they say, why? What's he done? And they just shout, crucify. See, dear friends, from a human perspective, Jesus is murdered because of envy. But so much of what happens in our world that's bad is motivated by envy. So I want to spend these last few minutes, I want to share with you two things. I want to share with you, number one, what envy does, and then I want to share with you what love does. I want to contrast those two because you and I, we have choices every day. Whether we give in to that old sinful nature or whether we allow God's recreation of our hearts and our minds to let us live in love. So number one, envy damages others. It always does. It, it creates havoc in our world. And while it seems like it's the thing that's most important to us, the fact is envy is sin and sin, when it comes to fruit in our lives, it hurts other people. I'll give you an example, painful example extramarital affairs. You understand that at its heart, it's driven by envy. You become discontented with what you have and you want what someone else has. But it's not limited to extramarital affairs. Most of the bad things that happen in our world are driven by envy. Remember the word that, that Pastor Steve told me about? Think about it in this context, that envy means to boil. Think about all the boiling that happens in our world and all the people, all the lives, all the things that are damaged because of envy. Now sometimes, sometimes the, the victim of that hurts somebody else. Sometimes that person who succumbs to envy hurts themselves. By the way, that's, something funny happened. You know, I, I mentioned we were in Phoenix this last week. And the crazy thing about being in Phoenix in February is that they, they advertise this conference to, to the folks in the Midwest about come to Phoenix, you know, and all this beautiful, warm, 80-degree weather. Well, lo and behold, last week in Phoenix, it was freezing. <laughs> On Friday and, and, and Saturday morning, I wore my, my puffy winter jacket all day long. It's crazy. But you know, the people from Minnesota... They're walking around in shirt sleeves, like, woohoo! In fact, I was talking to, to one guy, he's a, he's a really good guy, he's the chairman of the Lutheran Hour Ministry Board, and I serve on that board, so I know him, and we were talking at one point during the conference, and uh, he was sort of laughing, because he's standing there with his sunglasses on, and he said, you know, this really isn't good, and I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it seems to happen this way every year, at least for the last few years, I leave to come to best practices in Minneapolis where he lives and in Minneapolis where my wife is because she's got a job, she, she's not able to come to the conference, they get a blizzard. He said, it's happening right now. In fact, I think they're getting a blizzard literally right now. But he showed me a picture. He said, the, the last thing that I did before I left for the airport on Thursday was show my wife how to start the snowblower. And sure enough, 
It's snowing like crazy at home right now. In fact, she just sent me this picture. He took out his phone, showed me his text message, and on the picture, there's a picture of their driveway, and there are two strips down the driveway where she ran the snowblower about the width of a, tar, a car's tires. And a little message under the picture said, you can do the rest when you get home. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's envy. I think, I think they've got a great relationship, but you get the idea. Somebody has something you want. Somebody experiences something you want to experience. Somebody has success that you want to have. And the thing is, even if it doesn't drive you to to do something to hurt someone else, it makes you miserable. That's point number two. Envy damages others, and envy makes you miserable. Because there's no contentment, and there's no peace. Part of what God talks about over and over again in the scripture is that we should be people of contentment. We should be thankful. We should rejoice. And when we don't, when we're not thankful and when we're not content, it creates that boiling inside that leads to being miserable. And what's absolutely insane about that is that oftentimes we're miserable because we don't have bad things. Because remember, envy is part of our old sinful nature. So you and I see somebody and and they're doing all the wrong things. They're living in terrible ways. They're making terrible choices. But somehow or another, it seems like they're getting one success after another. They're getting, they're gathering up millions for themselves. And you and I look and and we're tempted to think, I wish I had that. Even though it's something bad and something wrong and something totally apart from God. And yet that old sinful nature stirs up that envy. God's word speaks to that. Do not be agitated by evildoers. Do not envy those who do wrong, for they wither quickly like grass and wilt like tender green plants. Do you understand? The point is, they may have something for a moment. You have eternity. They may have some some thing that the world says is glorious and we're even tempted to think it's what we want, but it's saying you are the heirs of eternal life. You will receive a reward, and you're not going to receive a reward like some humble servant. You will receive rewards from the hand of the creator. The creator of the universe will treat you and reward you like his beloved children. Don't be envious of something that's happening out there that's a flash in a pan, and it's going to be over before they know it. It will be far too short. Like vacation, right? If you're going on vacation, you think at the beginning of vacation, wow, we got all this time. And suddenly you're on the plane home thinking, where did it go? That's what the scripture is saying. Don't be messed up by that idea of something that's happening. It's going to be gone like that. Think about what you have for eternity. Envy damages others and envy makes you miserable. Let's go to the other side. What love does. Love serves others. So envy says to us, I don't have what I want. I don't have enough. I want that. I want that. I want that. Love says, no matter who you are, love says, I've got so much, I can give it away. I've got so much, I can use what I have, who I am, what I can do to bless, to serve somebody else. And the ultimate example of that is Jesus. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what Jesus said. I didn't come to be served, even though he gave up being king of glory, even though he left his throne in heaven, even though he gave his life. He didn't envy anything. He was the epitome of love, and so he served everyone. Dear brothers and sisters, serving isn't something that you do when you go on a mission trip. It's not something that you you gather together to do as some special project. Serving is something that should be on your heart and my heart and mind every single day. As God's love works its way into our minds and down to our hearts, as his love begins to transform the way we think, you and I should be thinking about opportunities to serve the people around us all the time. Imagine if Christ lived in us so much that you and I saw people and we thought, what can I do for him? What can I do for her? How can I bless them? What can I do for for the people in my family? How can I serve my spouse? Instead of being consumed with what we don't have, we're consumed with what we can give away, what we can do for somebody else. That's what love does. That's how it changes us. 
Love also overcomes misery. It overcomes misery and pain. Think about the message of the cross. That you and I are lost and broken. That we're separated from God. That that there's nothing in us that wants to, to, to be related to God. We want to be God. We're envious. It's the root of our sinful nature. And yet while we're still trapped in that ugly place, God sends his son and and the love of God and the love of his son Jesus turns envy upside down. In fact, it doesn't just turn it upside down. It crushes it. Think about it in our lives. Somebody does something or challenges something or, or deserves our anger, our ire, our resentment, our bitterness, but instead of caving in to that, We forgive them because forgiveness comes from love. And that forgiveness takes envy and discontent. It takes that boiling. And it not only turns it upside down, it crushes it. Have you ever seen people who are friends that shouldn't be friends, but they love each other because of forgiveness? Have you ever seen a married couple that shouldn't be together? But they are because forgiveness and love overcomes envy. That's what love does. You know, our slogan, I love our slogan. We put it on all the t-shirts. You know the one I'm talking about, right? I asked 930 this, and I'm just going to tell you, they knew it, but it, they were not very enthusiastic. Since it's the end of the morning, would you, would you do a little better for me? If nothing else, just for me, please. Our slogan is love. Serve, shine. Ah, awesome. Love, serve, shine. Now think about that. You and I are loved by God. We are loved by Christ with this sacrificial, incredible, transforming love. So that love settles on our lives and it redeems us and it blesses us and it begins to move us. And we are so moved by the love that God has for us that we love other people. And if we love other people, we ask the question, how can I serve? What can I do? How can I bless you? And you know what happens when we serve? We shine. You cannot help it. When you serve other people with the love of God in your heart, you cannot help but shine, not to your glory, to the glory of God. You know, that comes in pretty handy when our mission is to introduce people to Jesus. And that's why we're here, isn't it? I mean, at the heart of the matter, the most important thing you and I do, not preach Jesus, not lecture about Jesus, not manipulate people about Jesus, not guilt them into Jesus. Our job is simply to introduce them because if they meet him, if they meet the Jesus who loves us so much he gave himself for us, if they meet the Jesus that you and I know and gives us hope, they will love him just like we do. And that's why we love and serve and shine. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we are grateful that you didn't leave us stuck where we were, that you sent your son for us, and that he was so incredible that he cut through all of the stuff. And even when the the religious leaders did their best and they schemed and they got him exactly where they wanted him, when they had him nailed to that cross, it wasn't over. It was simply finished. And we received life and hope and forgiveness and love. Lord, let that love be the hallmark of who we are this week. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life. Amen.